Welcome everyone. I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager here at the Bell Museum. We're glad that you could join us this afternoon for another edition of our online version of Minnesota Night Skies. We're glad that we're able to continue to bring you this online programming for those of you that aren't able to come back to the museum. For those of you that are, we are reopened Thursdays through Sundays for limited hours and our planetarium is actually reopened for small shows. If you're interested in coming back, you can join us for those and you can get tickets in advance online. So today, we're gonna to be exploring what can be seen throughout September. And your guide for these evening observations is gonna be Thaddeus, the Bell Museum Planetarium Educator. If you have any questions uh, for him while we're going through this today, please enter that, those questions into the comment box on Facebook. I'm gonna be watching them closely and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. So thank you once again for joining us. Thaddeus, what will we be able to see in September? Uh, we will be able to see a lot of things in our September sky. Um, before we get to that, I actually wanna mention the non-virtual background that I have behind me. Uh, for those uh, who might remember from a few months ago, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope celebrated its 30th anniversary in space. And as part of that 30th anniversary, we got this really cool image. I'll uh, step out of frame. This image is also available online. We'll link to it so you can see it yourself. Um, but we have a actual printout of it. Uh, NASA printed out um, a few hundred for sites around the country. Um, we were one of the sites selected to receive it. We applied and we got, a, a, we got it. Um, and it is something, it's, they call it the Cosmic Reef, um, also known as NGC 20, the big red thing in the center, uh, and NGC 2014. Uh, over there on the blue, way over there. Um, or excuse me, uh, yeah, NGC 2020 over there in the blue. Um, and these are areas of stellar formation. So in particular, at the very center here, my disembodied hand is pointing to the uh, very center of, uh, of NGC 2014, where there's a lot of big bright stars that are releasing a lot of light. And uh, as they do that, they're heating up the gas around them. Um, we can also see a similar type of thing going down over there in 2020, uh, NGC 2020, uh, with one star at the center there, uh, shining light and, and heating up the gas around it. Uh, gas which is glowing in different wavelengths and different colors that the Hubble Space Telescope is able to see. Uh, so again, uh, that is, I'll stay slightly out of frame because it is, it is better looking than me. Um, this image is available online. Uh, all of Hubble data, NASA data, um, all the scientific data that is collected um, by US at least here, uh, this is all public domain, so it is open for everyone. Although on that note, I do wanna say uh, astronomy on the whole, uh, one of the great things about it, it is space is open to everyone, anyone, uh, mostly, almost anyone can go outside at night and look up in the night sky. Of course, depending on where you are, you might not see the same number of stars. But also historically, astronomy has not always been open to everyone, not always open to everyone of different socioeconomic classes. Uh, this has been a long-standing issue and it is being addressed more and more now um, and hopefully will be addressed more in the future. So that when I say space is open to everyone, I don't just mean people who look like me. But with that, I'm gonna take you on a tour of our night sky uh, and we are going to look at what's up in September. All right, and here in our September sky, uh, I am going to uh, set it up here um, so that we can, we can see what's up right here in the beginning of September. So we're here in our program called Stellarium, um, which you might be able to see in the title bar at the top, uh, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M, Stellarium. And this is a great piece of software. It's free software. Um, anyone can use it. It uh, can install it, uh, Windows, Mac. They have apps for your phone. It's one of my favorite pieces of software. Uh, along with the software we use in our full planetarium, which is a different piece of software and is also super cool and, and can do even more. Uh, but here in Stellarium, we're looking at the sky down here at the bottom. Uh, we can see 2020 uh, here at 2200, so 10 o'clock. Um, so just right here in the beginning of the uh, month of next month, we have a lot coming up in the sky. You can see some star names picked out um, right in front of us to the south, and we're looking right to the south here. We still have Deneb and Vega and Altair. These three stars make up our summer triangle. 
So even as we head into the fall months, um, our summer triangle, this prominent grouping of three stars is still gonna be visible. Um, and one of the easiest things to see, especially if you are here inside the Twin Cities or wherever you are, if you have a lot of light pollution. Now we are simulating the sky without a lot of light pollution. So we can see the Milky Way in the background as well there. Um, hopefully you can see it's a very faint, fuzzy band of light. So if it's hard to see on your monitors, well, that's great because it is hard to see in the night sky as well. You do need very dark skies to see it. Another bright star that's visible is farther over to the west, a star called Arcturus, uh, labeled far over here. Um, this is on looking to my right here on the screen. Arcturus is kind of a reddish orange star, um, so it's pretty prominent in the night sky. It stands out pretty well. Also visible further down to the southwest is another red star um, called Antares. Now, Antares, we've actually been talking a lot about the past month um, and throughout the summer. It's the heart of the constellation of Scorpius, uh, which is the scorpion. And ooh, one second here, I'm gonna try to get our, there's our scorpion. Um, still very close to the horizon there, so a little hard to see uh, Scorpius right now, but Antares will be there for at least the first part of the month. And that's just one of many constellations. Uh, Deneb, Vega, and Altair are actually part of three constellations called Lyra or Lyra, the harp. Uh, that's Vega. Deneb over here is part of Cygnus, the swan, nor the goose you can, uh, flying there through the night sky. And Altair is part of Aquila or the eagle. And in fact, if we go a little bit closer, all three of these, um, they cover a good part of the sky here to the south. And uh, the constellations are very bright. They have a lot of bright stars. Uh, and speckled in among, these uh, among these three constellations, we have our Milky Way again. And we also have other, a few other bright stars. So if you're looking up there, if you have a little bit less light pollution, uh, you might be able to pick out smaller constellations like Sagitta, the Arrow. Uh, further over here, we have Delphinus, the Dolphin, which is just one of my favorite constellations because I think it's kind of cute. Um, and even further away, as we continue moving, uh, well, in either direction, actually, um, we can see a star name has popped up here, um, Razal Ghul. It's pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. Um, this is the brightest star in Ophiuchus, um, the serpent bear. Now, all of these constellations, in fact, uh, from Scorpius to Ophiuchus to the Summer Triangle, if you want to learn more about them and how to find them, we actually talk about that in our Constellation Hunter video series. Um, which I helped put together along with uh, Sarah, our uh, Planetary Programs Coordinator. Um, so check our Facebook page for those videos um, as well to see how you can find these constellations and more. And speaking of more, uh, if you are looking at the sky and eh, maybe the stars, they're fine. You wanna see some other things? Great. Right here again, right in the beginning of the month, the first day of the month is a great day to look at the sky because to the south, we have two very bright points of light right above the horizon, these are two planets. And in fact, right over here to the right, we have the largest planet in the solar system. And a little bit to the left of it, we have the best planet in the solar system. Now, you've been to the planetarium or you just saw our virtual show last month. These planets were also visible and you might remember what they are. If this is your first time seeing them or looking for them in the sky, you're in for a treat because over here on the right, the biggest planet is Jupiter. And further over to the left, the best planet is Saturn. And try to get some labels up there. Uh, so Jupiter and Saturn, both visible, and they're gonna be visible throughout the month, which I'll show in just in a few minutes here. If you do have binoculars or a telescope, uh, highly recommend looking at these planets. Jupiter, especially with something like binoculars, you might see actually like a little bit like that. Very bright point of light in the center, and then a few little dots nearby it. We can see the names have popped up. Uh, over here we have Callisto. Much closer in, we have Europa and we have Io. And then if you were really quick, I'll zoom back out a little bit, way over to the left. Um, oh, we have a star there actually. Um, so there's some stars nearby. Uh, and I'm guessing the fourth moon here, Ganymede, is actually behind Jupiter. But we can see the Galilean moons, um, bright points of light there. Uh, if you have a telescope, you'll see them much more clearly and you'll be able to see Jupiter more clearly as well. Um, oh, Ganymede's hiding somewhere over there. Uh, the beautiful stripes across the atmosphere, actual gas rising and falling in the atmosphere is visible. All right, but, but don't spend all your time on Jupiter. Um, hop over to the best planet, which is Saturn. Take a look at its rings, at some of its moons like Titan, 
uh, the second largest moon in the solar system. Uh, and yeah, just, just spend as much time as you can looking at Saturn. Basically, if you do nothing else in September, just go out and look at Saturn. It is 100%, 1,000% worth your time. Whether you're seeing that with the unaided eye, with binoculars, with a telescope, with the Hubble Space Telescope, if you can. If you can, please talk to me. I want to talk to you. Uh, and zooming out back again, um, there's actually one more uh, planet we can see right here in the early evening. Uh, so right here at just uh, 2210 o'clock here on September 1st, if you're looking, hopefully you're spotting it. Um, it's further over, way over to the east. It's just above the horizon. Now, if you're not, can't see exactly uh, the quality here, the share, the screen share might not be great. Uh, I'm actually gonna advance forward through time. Um, because we'll see as we go forward through the month that Jupiter and Saturn will still be visible. Um, some of these stars, these constellations we found, they'll still be visible, but new things will come into view. So as I go forward uh, from, and I, I forgot to mention the giant bright thing there that's moving. Uh, another good reason the beginning of the month is really great is we have our uh, full moon or almost full moon. Um, there, I think, uh, according to Stellarium, we're just a day away from full or so. So also a great thing to see. Um, I'm sorry if you love the moon, I'm sorry I missed it until now. It is very, very cool. Another great thing to look at the entire, uh, entire year or entire month. All right, coming back out, um, we got the moon there. But if we look over to the east, um, that is gonna be the sort of the left as I'm looking over here, if you can see my mouse uh, uh, pointer there. And as our moon moves along, um, as it does, it'll actually there about the fifth, go right by that little dot over there. But as we go forward about, uh, we'll go two weeks into right into mid uh, September here, um, we have a bright, bright point of light over here to the east. Now, if you're looking, hopefully you can see, if you go outside at night, you'll definitely see some color to this object. It should be well, hopefully a bit of a nice reddish orange color. Um, and if you really look, you should see it's a nice solid point of light. It's not twinkling like the other stars, like Vega and Altair and Deneb, like Antares or Arcturus. It's, this spot of light is nice and solid. You've put it together, uh, you've figured it out uh, that this is in fact the red planet Mars. So Mars will be visible in our sky again all throughout the month, just like Jupiter and Saturn. Um, in fact, we are approaching opposition um, when Mars is at its closest approach to the Earth, about 40 million miles away, um, and very well positioned, very, uh, relatively speaking, very high above the horizon, so very easy to see. Um, you might not see it like this. This is uh, a view, in fact, probably with something like the Hubble telescope. Um, you look in binoculars or tel a telescope, your own backyard telescope, be more of a bright red point of light. But if you do spend enough time on Mars, um, your eyes adjust, you start to see a little bit more. The southern polar ice cap should be nicely positioned for viewing uh, as we go through September and the rest of the year. Um, you might see some haze over Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus. So uh, actually very thin clouds form over that largest volcano in the solar system, that giant mountain. Here we can also see a little bit of, uh, of Valles Marineris, a giant canyon across the surface of Mars as well as its two moons. A little bit harder, much, well, it was a much harder spot. You do need to spend some time with these, but Phobos and Deimos are visible if you, if you really get into looking at Mars. Mars has been in the news a lot. If you've been paying attention to space news, you know it's been in the news a lot. There is a new rover on the way to Mars, the Perseverance rover. Um, and it was due to arrive there early next year, February 18th, 2021. Um, it will begin the first real sustained hunt for ancient, uh, ancient life, ancient signs of life on Mars. Um, so keep your eye on the news for perseverance. Um, it is also carrying uh, Ingenuity, the first helicopter, a uh, really aerial vehicle ever sent to another world. Um, very cool piece of engineering. It is uh, going to be the stepping stone for other great things we do in the future when it comes to Mars. All right. Looking here, if you're if you're if it's showing up, also over by the east, um, by Mars, we have another planet. Uranus is visible. Um, that will be visible with a telescope um, or really, really, really good pair of binoculars. Um, don't expect to see that with the unaided eye. Um, sorry, at two and a half billion mile or two billion miles away from the sun, it's just too faint. All right, 
Quickly while we're looking here though, um, and as I check my time, see how we're doing. Um, there are some more constellations I do want to point out. Um, I'll bring up the other ones. Oh, and a few more popped up as well, actually here. Um, we have uh, over where Jupiter and Saturn are, we have Sagittarius the Archer. Sagittarius is actually most easily found by this grouping of stars called the Teapot, because if you look at it really closely, well, actually not even that close. If you just look at it, you get a handle, you get a lid, you get a spout, and you get the steam of the Milky Way rising up out of this teapot here. Further over where, uh, where I was clicking somewhere, Aquarius shows up, um, and over where Mars is, is Pisces. Pisces and Aquarius are both pretty faint constellations. They don't have a lot of bright stars in them, um, so they can be a little bit harder to find. The main head of Pisces though, uh, the cornet of Pisces is usually one of the most distinguishing features. Um, so you could try going and looking for that. Aquarius just has a few bright stars sort of scattered around. Um, so, uh, you know, do your best. Um, never hurts to go out and look for it. Um, and if you can find it, um, then you get to one up all the other astronomers out there who can't, like this guy. All right. Um, Looking nearby uh, Aquarius and Pisces, we also have a few bright stars that are, that are sort of standing out. Um, these bright stars are part of a few different constellations. Over here, in fact, the star right above uh, Aquarius is Nef, and it's part of Pegasus. Um, many people's favorite constellation, uh, Pegasus, the winged horse over here. And even further along, uh, we have a bright star over here uh, that is actually, it's depending on how it's drawn, sometimes it's actually connected to Pegasus, but it is Mirac and it's part of the brightest, one of the brighter stars in Andromeda that we can see over here. And, uh, you know, since we've come so far over to the east, I'm actually going to change the view here. We have been looking to the south, but I'm going to bring us over to the east. Actually, you know, I'm just going to bring us all the way around to the north. Um, south and north tend to be the two directions we primarily focus on when we're looking at the sky um, because it's usually pretty easy to find south if you know where the sun sets. Um, it sets in the west, rises in the east. Um, so if you keep west on your right um, where the sun is setting, then you're facing south. Um, the sun also moves across the southern sky. So if you're able to keep track of where that is moving um, without looking at it directly, of course, um, then you can figure out south. North also ends up being very easy to find because as some of you have been waiting for, I am sure, um, to the north is where we find our Big Dipper. Uh, so we can see that actually, uh, hopefully pretty clearly, it's a little bit to the northwest. It's kind of close to the horizon this time of year, um, sort of lining up with the horizon. Um, if, uh, if you're not sure where it is, just really go out and take a look around. Um, here in the Twin Cities, with the light pollution we have, the Big Dipper is one of the few bright groupings of stars that we can see. Um, so it, it stands out in that own way, which is nice because it's easy to see. But it's right over here, the Big Dipper, um, and it is part of actually a very large constellation called Ursa Major. Now, some of you might know what Ursa Major is. Bef before I put up some artwork, um, I'll, I'll point out what we can do with the Big Dipper, which if we take these two stars here at the end of the bucket, Merak and Dube, we take these two stars, and we imagine a line in between them continuing onwards, we find the bright star Polaris, the end of Ursa Minor. Now Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, these are our bears, so the big and little bear there. But Polaris there at the end of the handle of uh, the Big Dipper, or excuse me, the Little Dipper, is also our North Star. So this is the one star that as we go throughout the year, um, is, or throughout the night, or throughout the year, is always in the same place. So I'm actually going to jump forward. I'm going to go forward to the end of uh, end of September. So another two weeks in the in the future here, um, and from there we can see as I as I go forward through time, one day at a time, we can see the stars uh, appearing to move, spinning around a bit here, and as we come to the 30th, we can see the Big Dipper has moved a little bit. Some other stars to the right, to the west, uh, excuse me, to the east have have risen up, but Polaris is still right there, still still in the same spot, right to the north. So south is easy to find because we have the sun uh, and north is easy to find because we have Polaris. Now, Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky, not like the 49th brightest star. So if you're having some trouble finding it, just always go back to the Big Dipper there. Look for it first and then use those two stars, the bucket, to point up there. 
All right, but now that we've come a little bit later in the year and in the, uh, in the month here, um, we still got some of these familiar constellations. If I, if I zoom all the way out, we can see, ooh, zoomed out a little too much there. We can see Pegasus and Andromeda and Pisces and, and so on and so forth. They're all there, um, but we have some other ones that are now a little bit easier to see. In fact, looking to the north right nearby Andromeda, high up here to the northeast, there's a grouping of five stars. They form a W or an M if you're from the better state of the two. And that gives us Cassiopeia. Uh, in astronomy uh, or in mythology, this is the uh, mother of Andromeda. And uh, if you know your mythology and you know the story of Cassiopeia and Andromeda, then you may also know that there's a great hero in that story. Right down here in the Northeast, we have that hero, Perseus. Perseus also featured rather prominently last month. I hope many of you, I hope you all got out, a got out and got a chance to see the Perseids meteor shower. Um, one of the brighter meteor showers of the year. Um, it was mainly cloudy when I went out, um, but I did get a few nights there, especially um, I got out camping and in just a few minutes saw half a dozen meteors, uh, bright lights flashing through the sky. It was very cool. It was, it was beautiful. Um, and it's always just beautiful, but nice to go out and look at the night sky when you can. All right, so the person over there. Now, if you notice, there's a bright star labeled down here in the Northeast. Kind of close to the horizon, but down here is Capella, uh, which is part of the constellation of Auriga or Auriga, the charioteer. Or if you look at it really closely and if you can find it in the sky, you may also see this constellation as more of the giant blob in the sky. You probably won't find that in the scientific literature, but I think it should be there. Now, Capella is easier to see during the winter months, so I will save anything more about that for well, the winter months. Sticking with our sky right now, um, over uh, a little bit further to the east, um, where Andromeda and Pisces are, we have a little bright star here called Hamel, which is part of the very small constellation of Aries, the Ram. Um, Aries here, just a few bright stars put together um, to make a Ram shape there. And uh, if you can imagine that, you're doing better than I am. Uh, looking over here as well, we we filled up quite a bit of the sky here. So in fact, throughout the month, one great thing to do is if you go outside and, and you find a constellation, find one like, start with the Summer Triangle, like we did, um, with Deneb and Vega and Altair. Start with finding those constellations of Cygnus and Lyra and, and Aquila, and then just mark them down. Make a note of where you saw them. Um, maybe do a little sketch if you can. Um, pretty just, you know, simple stick lines here, pretty, pretty easy to draw. And then the next night you go out, the next time you go out, um, you know, try to find them again and then find a few more, a few more. Um, add in Pegasus over here, um, which is a very distinctive square. Um, go down from there to find Andromeda, just, you know, just a straight line coming off it. You try to find one of those fainter ones like Pisces. Try to imagine Aries if you can. Um, and then go back to some easy ones. Go find the Big Dipper, find Ursa Major, um, find Ursa Minor, go with that bright M of Cassiopeia. And keep using these constellations to start filling up the sky. In fact, out of all everything we see here, there are even more constellations. I think, I know I'm running over on time here. Um, in between Ursa Major and Minor, Draco the Dragon, um, continuing over to the west, close to the horizon, just looking for a bright star here. Um, we find Elphica uh, or Gemma, um, which is part of uh, Corona, Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. It's one of the simple, simplest constellations, one of my favorites. It is just sort of a bowl shape here or a crown shape. Um, and then finally, one more I'll point out right near the center of the sky, now that we're looking to the south here at the end of the month at 10 o'clock, um, we do have uh, Aldermon, uh, part of Cepheus, the king, um, sort of a upside down house as we look at it here. Um, just a box and a roof here, some walls and a roof. Um, right near Cassiopeia, though. So another another easy constellation to find. Okay, there are a lot more constellations. There's a lot more I could talk about, but I, I want to make sure that we've got some time for any questions. Um, so Amber, um, I know you've been monitoring the chat. Um, interrupt me. Tell me uh, what uh, what are people wondering about? I haven't seen any questions that have managed to make their way through, with the exception of one. So yeah. I think I might ask you to answer this one question, and then we. But we'll probably end for the day. Okay. Um, so uh, the first, the question is: Do you only show European or Western constellations during these night sky shows? 
Great. That is a fantastic question. The short answer is yes, we do. Um, one reason for that, at least here, uh, well, depending on where we are, is that these are the constellations we tend, myself speaking person right now, that we're most familiar with, that I'm most familiar with. These are the ones I grew up with. Um, H.A. Rays, um, you know, connecting um, H.A. Rays, the stars. Um, that is not to say that there are not a lot more out there and more that we do reference. Um, in fact, we are currently working on and we've worked on the past and continuing to work with uh, contributors like Annette Lee, um, part of Native Skywatchers. And um, with the guidance of indigenous groups here in Minnesota and the US, um, we are working on bringing in, in more indigenous content. Um, we are moving very carefully with that though. These are cultures, indigenous cultures like the Ojibwe, Dakota. These are cultures that are still around us right now. They, these are their stories, their, their, their past, their present, and their future. And I personally speaking here, especially, I want to make sure that I'm not going to get something very, very wrong, or real wrong at all um, when relating um, their, their, their night sky. That being said, here in Stellarium, one thing that I love about Stellarium, what Annette Lee has actually contributed to a Stellarium is that there are multiple sky cultures that we can look at. Um, so if you get Stellarium um, over in the viewing options, um, there's a section called Star Lore. And under Star Lore, we're sticking here with, we have West, I have Western selected. But if I do take a look over here at Ojibwe uh, constellations, um, we'll see it, the night sky here just pops up differently and I'll, I'll pull back a little bit. Um, and we can see looking here in our September sky, um, if we're looking through an Ojibwe lens, um, excuse me, Ojibwe lens, um, we can see that Pegasus over here, the square is actually moose, the moose. Um, the crane that we saw before, um, Deneb, that star at the end um, is also seen as, Annette, I apologize if, when I mispronounce these, um, a, a jik, uh, the the crane. Um, looking further down uh, to the north, um, we have, uh, instead of the Big Dipper here, we have Ojig, the fisher. Um, we can still use the fisher, the body of the fisher, to point to the North Star. And there we find uh, Mang, the loon. Um, one of my personal favorite constellations, um, actually, just because I, I do personally love loons. Um, I grew up uh, and I was able to go to a cabin during the summer and uh, there were loons on the lake. And it was, it was always it was just beautiful to hear them. Um, and further along, we see we see more constellations here. Uh, this, and again, uh, with Stellarium, there are many more um, contributed by people across the world, um, looking from Aztec constellations. Um, we see just one here, um, looking through Chinese constellations where they have hundreds, um, hundreds of constellations filling the sky. Uh, looking back here to the Americas, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota constellations. The same groupings of stars, generally, the easiest ones to see, but now imagined very differently, um, very different uh, interpretations that were much more relevant to people's lives. Um, it turns out the Dakota didn't have flying horses, could you believe it? Um, but they did see the turtle here, um, looking to the east with this great with this square. Um, and if you are, um, if you do want to learn more about these, these constellations, because they are out there, um, and and uh, then I, I encourage you to send us an email, to leave us another comment, to, to ask us, um, and to, to do some of the research yourself. Again, um, Annette Lee from uh, Native Skywatchers uh, has been uh, has been incredible to work with, and I'm I'm hoping we're going to continue uh, working together. Um, check out our, our in fact our next star map coming out. Um, we'll have some comment from her and other contributors as well, um, because. To relate all of this content is truly a group effort um, because there is so much, uh, so much there to learn about, and uh, so much there that has been lost as well that we that that people are trying to to preserve. So, very great question, very long answer. That's me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for um, for for mentioning that, Ted. Thank you once again for joining us today. We hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everyone.